Sarah, we're in the middle of an interview. Not anymore, you're not. I'm Sarah Long. Mr. Stone hired me to represent you. Have you even given her Miranda rights? Of course we have, and she has agreed to the interview. I don't need an attorney. Okay? Yes, you do. Listen, not another word with her unless I'm in the room present. Sarah. Haley. Mr. Stone told me you might be behind all of this. I have an interest. Yeah, you do. A gaping conflict of interest, that's what you've got. I haven't broken any confidentiality. Well, that remains to be seen, doesn't it? But for right now, I'm going to work with my client. Alone. And Danny. Can you cut off all these recording devices in this room, every single one of them? Hey. Hey. Thank you for having me. Let me thank you for being here. And let me. Thank you, front row. We're all very excited to talk to you, rest assured. This, uh, this is your latest book Murder in the Courthouse. It's the third Haley Dean. That's me on the back several years ago. And um, this is the third in the Haley Dean Murder Mystery Series. And. Um, I, I love it. I love it. It's my fourth book. And Hallmark Movie and Mystery Channel has taken these characters and we've done an original screenplay called Murder with Love. Is that not awesome? <laughs> I made that up. Okay, so that's October 23, Sunday night. Get ready. Now, it may be too late for some of you. It starts at 9 o'clock. But stay up. It's worth it. <laughs> School night. How did you come up with this character? Okay, guys, let me tell you how Haley Dean happened. How did she, how was she born? Okay, first of all, um, I was in school to become a Shakespearean literature professor. I was about to say, you were going to be a writer before your life took a turn. Yeah, and that was my dream, and um, I fell in love in college and got engaged to be married, and my fiancé was murdered shortly before our wedding. And I dropped out of school. I lost down to about 89 pounds. I couldn't eat. I couldn't... I, I, my mother had to cl cut the clocks off in the house because I couldn't stand to hear the tick. And uh, at some point, I did go back to school, and that was with the intention of going to law school to put the bad guys away. Now, I didn't know who the bad guys were, actually, because I grew up in a very rural area. I didn't know anything about violence or hatred, nothing. So when Keith was murdered, my whole world exploded. I did completely blew me away. Um, so I prosecuted in inner city Atlanta, all felonies. I got a call to start a show with a guy, you may have heard of him, Johnny Cochran. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm busy. Well, as it turned out, my district attorney I worked for was retired. So I called them back and went, hey, you know that job? I'm coming. So I moved to New York with two boxes of clothes, a curling iron, and $300. What could go wrong, right? Okay, so anyway, I was out of the courtroom. I didn't know a soul, and I missed fighting crime really badly. And at night, when I would leave work, I would come home and started writing 11th Victim. And it's a mishmash of people I saw, cases I tried, judges, defendants, lawyers, uh, all mushed together. No one character is real. It's a conglomeration, a collage of all those years of prosecuting and all the crimes I saw, specifically on minorities, women, and children, uh, were my clients. Most of my clients were dead. Okay? <laughs> so I uh, was a, got to be the voice of those people that did not have a voice for the most part. And so I would write every night about Haley Dean. And, you know, I named her Haley because I had always wanted a daughter. And I thought after Keith was murdered, that would never happen. So I named this dream of a girl who was brave and brilliant and smart and wonderful, Haley, after Halley's Comet for once in a lifetime. 
Well, as part of God's plan, many, many years later, I did marry. You had twins. I had twins. And Lucy, my daughter and I, almost died during childbirth. And um, I felt my grandmother came to me who helped raise me while my mom was at work, Lucy. So I named her Lucy. So Haley will forever live on the pages of my book. How has Haley changed over the course of the books? Well, she's still a ball buster. I can tell you that much. I wonder where she gets that from. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, let's see. Well, Haley has a lot of flaws. People ask me, are you Haley? No, she is by far um, a better person than I am or have ever been. And she's quite the crime sleuth. Um, Haley is flawed in that the murder of her fiancé kind of cracked something in her, and she has never been able to get past that. Her whole life has been governed and steered by what happened. And, you know, a lot of times people ask me, what advice do you give crime victims? You know, it was um, almost 30 years after Keith's murder before I felt I could take one step forward uh, and ha try to have a family. 30 years. That's my only advice is to try to move on. Haley has not moved on, but she's an incredible crime fighter. <laughs> she is. Well, and she also is a very, very passionate person with a lot of convictions. She is. I wonder where she gets that from. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of Haley is made up of what I observed in the court in the courtroom. And by the way, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about your record as a prosecutor because you kind of have ignored that. You had what a nearly hundred percent conviction I rate. I did have a one hundred percent win rate at trial. Knock on wood. So far, just in case I ever go back. Um, now I feel I, like give credit where credit is due. Yeah, yeah, I ran into trouble on appeals once in a while, but I did have that 100% uh, win record at trial. And most of those were hardcore felonies. Now, my first trial, jury trial, was an attempted shoplifting. Now, it was charged as a shoplifting. However, there was one small problem. The guy didn't take anything at all from the Kmart. He got out a knife out of his pocket and sliced down, I think it was a CD player, off the display and stuck it down the front of his pants and then snuck around the Kmart and then left it and walked out and they arrested him anyway. And I had to try that. Okay, I offered him straight probation. I'm like, please, please, please. They wouldn't do it. So I had to go to trial. And I told the jury it was not a shoplifting. It was an attempted shoplifting. And that was my first conviction. It didn't help the way he looked, okay? He was very pale and sickly looking and little and pitiful. And, you know, you know jury doesn't want to convict somebody sick, okay? They don't want to send them to jail. But, you know, they so. want to buy them a good meal. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and I also remember my first trial because it was in the Atlanta Fulton County Courthouse on the fifth floor. And I, that was when women thought they had to dress like men. So I had on a shirt up to here. And, of course, we didn't wear ties. They had like a fake rosette right here. And a suit and the skirt and the hose. And my hair was about down to here, up on my head. The air condition went out in Fulton County Courthouse that day. It was so hot. By the end of the trial, I had my jacket off, my shirt was untucked, my hair was over here, and all this black stuff was all down here. I think they really just felt sorry for me. <laughs> they were like, just let her, me have it. Yes. let her have it. Yes. You, when you were on headline at HLN, yeah. what used to be known as headline news, you became known as being a very vocal victim's advocate. Did you ever s visualize your career taking you that way? No. Um, I never visualized being on TV. I thought I would be a teacher. Um, but after what happened with Keith, I do remember that after that first jury trial, the attempted shoplifting, I remember walking out of the courthouse, and I was the one who would sit like this in law school and just take notes. And when I finally began actually fighting crime, I felt like a bird out of a cage. I don't know where that voice came from, but it happened. 
day. So, no, I never saw that. But it's the right thing. Well, and you're, you were very outspoken about certain cases, like the Casey Anthony case. Right. How do you look back on that, and how did you choose which cases to champion? Well, it's, it's funny about that case. Um, I remember the moment. I was on the way to work, and I had just bathed the children, and they were, I was soaking wet because they did not like me to go to work. Okay. So if they saw me put on shoes, they'd start crying. If they saw me put on anything but a, a T-shirt and a pair of black workout pants, they'd start crying. Uh, if they saw makeup, oh, forget about it. So what I would do, I would have to bathe them. I'd be soaking wet. I would climb out the window and go to the car. And I was in the car on the way to work, and they went, the third story fell out. I'm like, What? Maybe it was a missing person that had been found or we were manhunt. And I'm like, okay, let me go back through our choices. And I'm like, wasn't there a missing girl, like a two-year-old girl in Florida? And they went, yeah. And I said, well, what, what's the word on that? Well, the mom was the last one to see her, but she didn't report her missing. I said, who reported her missing? The grandmother reported her missing 30 days later. I'm like, what? Huh? Huh? <laughs> and that, it, I said, put it in. And that's how that happened. How did you, when you were on TV, how did you know what cases would resonate with people? I don't know. I don't know, don't know the answer to that. And, and the way we do it is, I guess, a complicated process, but I've been doing it so long it doesn't seem complicated. I research myself until around midnight, and I get up around 5 or 5.30, and I research again. And we have one staff member that watches all morning shows across the country. Of course, you know, the networks, but others as well. And then we have other people that go strictly to websites. We scour all the newspapers. And every morning, I have myself and four others on a call that starts at 8. And we go through about 60 or 70 cases every morning. And we'll rule them in or out immediately, you know, as to what I think a viewer might want to hear about. And then we get it down to 20, then 10, and then 5, and then we go round robin. Each person has to throw something out until we get to the final three. Yeah, see, that's so fascinating to me, how you that's guys how we decide do what's on. Yeah. And now that your show is ending, your contract yeah. is up, are you gonna, do, you, do you think you're going to write more books? Or more frequently, I should well, say. Well, yes. I'm, all, I'm almost through. I'm about a little over halfway through with Murder Times 10. If that name's not already taken. Uh, maybe I've just been working on it so long. Okay. I think it's already taken. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm, I'm working on that one. And they're like, my books are like a James Bond opening. I like to open with a really good scene. Like in this one, I'm not going to give it away. But somebody does get severed in half. In the beginning. As, 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 often as they happens. should, okay? And uh, so I'm, I'm on, on, on to that one. And um, that also, I'm going to launch a crime website. You know, in this world that we live in, if I want to help find missing children and solve unsolved homicides, TV is an awesome platform. But quickly overtaking that is digital. And I believe that I can reach more people more quickly and on their schedules through digital. Do you, do you feel that that's your calling now? My calling is to try to do, I really feel this strongly, and I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but I truly believe that my calling is to do all the good I can as long as I can. And the way I see that happening now is a you know, hopefully a traditional TV platform, but also through digital. I feel that people aren't necessarily sitting down and watching the 6 o'clock news anymore the way our parents or grandparents used to. Do you remember how that was like the tradition? You got yeah. home, you had dinner, you watched the news I with remember. Peter Jennings. You know, when I was saying, you know, I grew up in an area where we didn't really have any crime. We, well, we were all poor, actually, but we didn't know we were poor. The children didn't anyway, so I was perfectly happy. Uh, I remember seeing crime distantly on the TV sometimes during dinner. It would be playing in, in the den while we were in the kitchen. And we really know. But it's not like that anymore. You know, just that our society doesn't sit down and stare at the TV at 6 o'clock. So there's got to be another way 
to help missing children and missing Connect people. Connect with people. Yeah. And last question before we go to our audience. I know that you worked, obviously, as you mentioned, with Johnny Cochran, and he's been getting a ton of coverage posthumously through the O.J. Simpson um, American Crime Story yeah. on FX, which was fantastic. What is your memory of working opposite him? <sighs> it's a dichotomy. I didn't agree with a thing he said, <laughs> but I loved him and his wife, Dale. And I'll, can I do a quick impression? Yes. Okay. I learned so much from him, and I was dead set to hate his guts. Because I'm like, oh, they did it. And he went, jury convicted him. I'm like, how can you say that? Okay. Just, he loved it when I would get mad. So this is Johnny. But I watched him, and I watched the way he was with people. And that's why that man won so many cases. There's just something about him that you liked him. You wanted to hang out with him. You wanted to just get him to stay another minute and talk. That's just the kind of personality, you know, that person you want to be with? That's him. Okay, this is Johnny Cochran entering a room. Okay, ready? Pretend I want, that. I'll be a so client. You be the room. No, a party, okay. a party, a party. All right, all right. Okay, here's the door. He would pause. He would always pause. In, entering the room and just, you know, like drink it all in, look around. Of course, everybody would run up to him because he's so famous. And then he would walk in, usually to accolades and hangers-on and fans. And he was always very, very gracious to everyone that spoke to him. What did you learn from him? Um, I learned that you don't always have to be right to win the battle. Sometimes it doesn't matter. It matters how you can reach the jury. Um, you don't have to always be technically right. You don't always have to be the smartest, the most brilliant, the most prepared. And um, he was more laid back than me. And I think my passion or my desire for justice is what would speak to a jury. But his um, personality, his charisma, he's just very, very charming. And I think he was uh, the kind of person the jury wanted to believe in. That's what I learned from him. That's certainly how he came across. Yeah, and it, it was true. It was true. And now to our audience, please. <sighs> Hi, Nancy. I'm Jennifer. I'm your biggest fan. You're everything to me. So thank you so much for all that you do for the victims and the children. Thank you. I have two questions. Okay. The first question is, if you saw the devil, Casey Anthony, in a dark alley, what would you say? Wow, that's a strong question. <laughs> you know, I, I've been asked many times, what, if anything, I would ask Casey Anthony, top mom. And I've actually thought about it. I know that she would lie, so what's the point of asking her anything about that day? Because she's going to lie. But one thing I'm curious, I'm curious how it felt in court when her mother took the stand, and I've met her mother many times. She's a very nice lady. You know, the way George and Cindy were portrayed during that, I mean, it was the worst time in their lives. People are camped out in their front yard. They go out there and yell at them to get off their yard. I mean, their grandchild was gone. And everything was being videoed. And I know that they were portrayed sometimes in a bad light, but they weren't like that at all when I met them. They were very, very nice. And I always wondered how Top Mom could sit there in court and let her mother go up on the stand and volunteer to lie under oath to save Top Mom's neck. You remember those damning videos, those damning searches online about how do you make, oh, what was it? Um, chloroform, I think. Yeah, thank you. How do you make homemade chloroform? How do you this? How do you that? Everything, and that is what they found traces of in Top Mom's car. And to think that Cindy Anthony, I mean, what, the, what 
polarization. On one end, you have Cindy Anthony ready to go to jail to save Casey Anthony. And on the other end, you have Casey Anthony letting her mother walk into the lion's den and what she did to her daughter. I mean, I just wonder what went through her mind as her mother went up there and tried to take the rap for her. You know, now that is motherly love, right? That's one thing that struck me in that trial is how much Cindy Anthony loved Casey and Kelly. I mean, so much, you know? That's what I remember from that. My second question for you would be, of the many cases that you've covered, is there one that is unsolved that haunts you at night? Oh, gosh. There are so many. Um, many of them are too sad for me to bring up because they deal with children that have been horribly mistreated, uh, that were killed, and, and, and really worse than death is the life that they lived before they were killed. I, I don't know what it is about crimes on children. I had a wonderful childhood. My parents really worked a lot and were away, but we were so happy. What I think, when I look at my children, they're so little and so precious. The thought that someone would hurt them or beat them, or kill them, or abuse them. It's almost more than I can take. Those are the crimes that have bothered me, and still to this day bother me the most. Can I tell you, my son is as tall as I am. He's only eight. And I still, we have a throwdown every time we're in public and he wants to go to the men's bathroom. I'm like, no, you are not. Because I remember uh, Matthew Checky, who went in the bathroom and was killed. All the children that are uh, attacked. I mean, you know, it has affected my life in a, a big way and sadly will probably affect the children, you know, because I watch them like a hawk. <laughs> no, so. Next question, please. Hey, Nancy, congrats on the book. It's so cool you're donating the proceeds, right? That's so I cool. I am donating a portion of my proceeds from this book to National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children, just like I did with Dancing with the Stars, because what they do, there is no, no replacement for what they do, you know? That's so cool. I want to ask you, I heard you say girl-on-girl -girl murder is rare. How'd you learn that? Well, I would advise you to read Method and Assessment of Homicide and Suicide. Now, it's pretty dry reading because it's I was about to say, that sounds riveting. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of graphs and charts. And um, I'll tell you, when I read it for the first time, <laughs> I had a case in Atlanta, a very prominent family, and a woman was killed. She committed suicide in her bed at home. Naked. Okay. Right there, it just, it just struck me wrong. But we were, I was sent by the district attorney to go investigate the case. Well, I went to the crime lab first. And they had the sheets from her bed. And the, this guy, he had an accent much worse than mine. And <laughs> he had the sheets up in front of a light. He's just looking at him. I'm like, I started looking at him. I'm, didn't know what I was looking at. And I said, what are we looking for? And he went, well, Nancy, you see that blood spatter? I'm like, yes. He went, that was the blood spatter they found under her pillow. How can gunshot spatter get under your pillow when you're laying on top of it? Okay, all right. That's the first time I fell in love with blood spatter. And um, as it turned out, it was not a suicide. It was a homicide. And it was proven in a court of law. I can guarantee you that. Nancy, your next book, Blood Spatter, A Love Story. <laughs> Seriously. I like it. Seriously. The twins are always coming up with awesome titles. And last question over here, please. 
Hi, Nancy. I just want to know what advice do you have for people who want to pursue law and what, sh what should they get ready for in the future? Well, I can tell you this. One thing you're going to have to know, A, you got to have good grades. Bam. Okay. If you don't have good grades, go back and retake it. Um, get ready for the LSAT. I was such an idiot. I just like went to the bookstore and got one of those books about taking the LSAT and then just went and took it. Now they have all sorts of, of study courses. Take them. Um, in law school, I, of course, I was fresh off the murder of, of my fiance. All I did was study and work, work and study. I even studied in the bathtub. If you look at my criminal law study books, they have like water drops all over them. Um, but I, I also think that one thing a lot of lawyers don't have which you probably already have, is the ability to communicate and to not be afraid. Not be afraid. If you believe in your case, or anything for that matter, don't listen to what other people say. You do what you think is right. And then let the chips fall where they may. Win or lose. That is stellar advice. <laughs> And Thank you. when can we see your Hallmark movie? Guys, the book is out today. It's Born Today, Murder in the Courthouse, and that's real blood. I told Dan blood Abrams spatter. this morning on GMA, I'm like, this is Dan Abrams' blood. He looked for a moment like he believed me. I'm like, Dan, it's not your blood. Uh -huh. <laughs> so anyway, that's out today, and the movie is coming to Hallmark Movie and Mystery, October 23rd, Sunday night. At 9 p.m. 9 o'clock Eastern. So stay up late. Thank you so much. <laughs>